Hello, welcome to the fourth program of our ninth annual film and discussion series presented by the Woodstock Land Conservancy, Woodstock New York Transition, and the Woodstock Jewish Congregation. My name is Polly Howells and I'm with Woodstock, Woodstock Transition. The Woodstock Land Conservancy is a nonprofit organization committed to the protection and preservation of open lands, forests, water resources, scenic areas, and historic sites in Woodstock and the surrounding area. Woodstock Transition is part of the global transition town movement of communities working to reimagine and rebuild our world in response to the challenges of our time. Woodstock Transition has seven active working groups that engage locally to strengthen our community's resilience and create positive alternatives. The Woodstock Jewish Congregation is dedicated to the advancement of Jewish ethics, culture, and religion, including the Torah's teaching that humans are to be the guardians of the earth. The, Wood the Woodstock Jewish Congregation strives to incorporate sustainability practices into all of its operations so that it may become a model of environmental stewardship. Tonight's program is about regenerative farming as a path toward human and planetary health. Regenerative farming has a threefold benefit. It draws carbon down from the atmosphere and develops healthy soil, which when planted with vegetables, fosters human health. We will begin our program with a short cartoon describing carbon sequestration. Then the movie Farmer's Footprint about one family's journey to regenerative practices. Del Orlowski has recorded a PowerPoint connecting the soil microbiome with the human microbiome. After that, he will join two local farmers, Nancy Custer of Deep Roots Farm in Ankrum and Alia Kavache of Clove Valley Community Farm in High Falls, who will discuss their experiences with regeneration. Their talks will be followed by a Q&A. Please put any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat. Hope you enjoy our evening. If you're like most people, you're probably feeling a little hopeless about climate change and the damage we've done to our planet. Well, now there's a new way to look at climate change and how to deal with it that might just turn that hopelessness into hope. Climate change, as we know, is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere. But carbon is not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it, even us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants first appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, that would be us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which was pretty much a timeout zone for carbon. We've been burning it for energy, putting into play, and disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, throwing off the ocean's balance, resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course we need to stop burning fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get the cycle back in balance? The good news is that the answer is literally right under our feet. It's the soil. Plants, using sunlight and water, naturally perform photosynthesis. They pull carbon in from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of these sugars down through the roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build healthy soil. Voila, carbon moved. The plants pump it in and the soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost can help regenerate healthy soil, 
setting up an ongoing feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. Together with other regenerative practices, like not tilling the soil, planting trees and cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain billions of tons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich and full of life and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone who eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into our atmosphere or pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. Grant and Dawn and their daughter Carly have all become outspoken advocates. Actually, we sort of consider them one of our shining stars of the regenerative agriculture movement. I don't know if, if anyone remembers the old Barbara Mandrell country hit, I was country when country wasn't cool. That's sort of how I feel about the way I grew up. At least 90% of what we ate every day came from the farm. But my education told me that, no, nope, we weren't doing things right. Suddenly, all of the things that we didn't seem to need when I was growing up, like the antibiotics and, and a lot of the farm chemicals and, and the livestock pharmaceuticals and, and feed supplements, all of a sudden became very important. And I was convinced that if we were going to keep up with the times, we had to have that. And over the years, what I discovered was that we were having more and more problems not less, that in spite of all the research we were doing, in spite of all the new pharmaceuticals, all the new antibiotics, all the new supplements, 
all the new ag chemicals and fertilizers, things were not going well. Instead of solving the problem, what we were really doing was just constantly putting band-aids on what I now understand as a gushing wound. Farmers have the highest rate of suicide of any profession in the U.S. Their quality of life has diminished to the point that many of them hate what they have to do every day. I've never enjoyed mixing up a spray recipe of any kind. I've never enjoyed sitting in a sprayer. I've never enjoyed dealing with those chemicals with all the protective gear on. Farmers are finding that it's harder and harder for them to, to make a living, to maintain equity, and to have a viable business that they can pass down to their kids and their grandkids. And a huge part of that is the need for these annual operating loans that keep them heavily in debt. The current farm bill has got us to where we are right now. We have to financially produce the crops that we can insure for the most profit. So that took a lot of the diversity out of our egg profile. The thing they're most afraid of is that they're gonna be the generation that failed and lost the farm. I knew that if we didn't do something, we were going to see a significant collapse in the existence of this family farm heritage and that multi-generational tradition. I was born and raised here. I'm the fourth generation on this farm, and I just had the fifth. Um, I've been here my entire life and had no ambition to go anywhere else. What we're doing here is setting our property up for my kids and my grandkids to farm it because the biggest thing that I've ever learned is we never own this land. We simply rent from the next generation. The beautiful thing about regenerative agriculture is that we can immediately begin implementing practices that are not going to cost the farmer, but are actually going to relieve financial burdens, particularly input burdens, and are going to increase their productivity in year one. It's very hard to hold a conversation with another farmer because we don't have that much in common anymore. And we know that we're talked about in the coffee shops and in the elevators and, and stuff like that, and because we hear about it. And it doesn't bother us anymore. At first it was kind of lonely and it, it, it bothered us, but now it doesn't because the benefits of what we do here and what we're seeing and ultimately the bottom line far outweigh what people are saying about us. So it's, it's okay. And this is what we're doing is becoming slowly but surely a little bit more accepted. And we went back to farming the way my dad's grandpa farmed. And to me, that's pretty cool. I've always felt like I was born into the wrong generation because I thought the way they were farming was pretty cool and now we get to do it. Grant and Dawn Brightcruits are a wonderful story. One of the first things we did was we changed that monoculture cover crop into a highly complex, diverse cover crop and that immediately became a game changer for them. Overnight they went from having cover crop failures to having cover crop success. They have made an absolute complete turnaround in not only their production practices but more importantly their their mindset. Hopefully it's not pink. That pink is our problem. What is that problem? That's the seed treatment. 99.8% of corn is treated is with treated that treatment. With treated seed. I'm pretty well convinced we don't need the treatment anymore. I mean, you look at what we got here, 
you know, with all these earthworms. I think we're done with that. Good. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> the neat part is, is that 118 year old seed company up the river here will provide us all the seed corn we need without that treatment. The consumer is driving the bus here. You know, they're, they're demanding more of this and so it's becoming more popular and they're looking for it more frequently and people like us need to be able to meet that demand. My goal is within five years to have a storefront here on the farm. Um, I love having people out here to see what we're doing. I'm planning on going to a lot of farmers markets with the wagon and we're using social media to market beef. I'm hoping that that'll broaden our consumer base. Their ability to be able to think about what they really need to be doing on their farm and how they need to be operating it. Uh, they have built significantly new soil, which conventional wisdom says no way you can build what they have built in the years that they have built it. And they have completely turned around their financial position, not just from a production standpoint, but also from a profitability standpoint. Not only is, is that food, you know, really, really good for you, but the pride in, in how, where that comes from is, is really awesome. In 2019 and 2020, 50 plus percent of all farmers in the U.S. are at significant risk for being able to get their annual operating loans renewed. And, and yet Grant and Dawn have provided a clear example of how to be able to feasibly step your way out of that situation and, and to be able to relieve both the financial pressure and the mental pressure. The first 12 rows of corn that we have in this section of corn here is the first corn that we've planted without any commercial fertilizer applied at all and so far we cannot see anything on the plant health that shows that we're missing any nutrients on it at all. So far, time will tell, but yeah. we had to try it. Yield, the yield will be the yield will be the indicator. indicator, so. The average farmer farming conventionally is losing between three and four tons of topsoil per acre annually. Now, let's think about that. That's, that's untenable, and that's absolutely unsustainable. When you can get to 60 to 70 earthworms per square foot, you've kind of got your soil health fixed, and, and we, are, we are very close, if not over that amount. This was the 25 acres that we treated as just a corn-soybean rotation with no cover crops. So last year, we cover cropped it to fix it. We fixed it in one year. The model that we were using when we started wasn't fun. No. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we were only doing one thing. We were producing bushels. That's yeah. all it was, and it was a race to see who could produce the most bushels. And yet, you, when you had to go answer the bank or everybody else, it's not there financially. Mm -hmm. Now it's fun. Yep. I mean, it's fun. What what could be yep. better than going out at five o'clock in the morning and riding through all this wildlife? And... Yep. 20 years ago, we couldn't have put together 10 people in a room. But yet, the number of people that are interested in regenerative practices and adaptive practices is growing very rapidly. When we met Dr. Zach Bush and started talking with him about what he had discovered and what he had uncovered. It really was a huge aha moment. Between 1996 and 2007, there was a complete reversal of our cancer map in the United States. To see an entire population respond in a single decade to a sudden explosion of cancer suggests that we did something similar to Chernobyl. We did some massive environmental injury that led to this explosive rise in cancer. 
And so we started, you know, looking into this understanding of glyphosate as an antibiotic. Glyphosate became a commodity in farming in 1996. Before that, it was used as a weed killer by homeowners and farmers alike, and it had to be used sparingly because it kills everything it touches. That was the history of, of this glyphosate Roundup chemical until 1996, and suddenly it became a crop treatment that actually functions as an antibiotic, killing the, the bacteria and the fungi, the plants, killing all of that life. And it's incredibly a water-soluble toxin, which means it can be carried. And so we took the glyphosate spraying maps, but interestingly, they don't superimpose on our cancer death maps until you pull in the tributaries of the Mississippi River and you suddenly realize that we're collecting some 80, 85% of all the glyphosate sprayed in the United States into a single water system. And if this is the most prevalent antibiotic in our environment that's decimating the microbiome in the soils, we had maybe a, a smoking gun. Maybe this is the event that, that really transformed public health. These degraded soils are not capable of producing highly nutrient-dense food. So the very foods that we're producing out of these soils now that are heavily degraded, they're deficient in the nutrients that we really need to properly feed our bodies in creating significant disease issues and neurological disorders and other illnesses that have degraded our health. Yeah. You think your great grandfather had seven chemicals in there killing everything in the well, soil? That's a, yeah. that's true. There's no way that was the case, yeah. else you would not have inherited a farm. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking at the end of this family farm tradition, and as they collapse, we open ourselves up to vulnerability because it's these multinational organizations that move in with money from China and South America, Russia, all over the world coming in to buy up massive swaths of the most fertile areas and they're owning our own land. No longer owned by Americans, let alone the farmers themselves. It makes absolutely no sense from any stance of homeland security or national safety, national independence. And if we look at this ever-expanding dependence and machine of mega farming scale, we become very prone to catastrophic failures of the delivery system. In the last month, we've had 18 million pounds of beef recalled through two different events because of E. coli and salmonella, these invasive bacteria that are a symptom of a collapse of the greater microbiome of those cows. It takes a mega industry to screw up that big, to make us that vulnerable. And so as the scale grows of the farm, we should not be deluded that that means safety. It means danger. It means an extreme dependence on an extremely tenuous situation. We have an opportunity, though, to overcome the fear. And I see that happening on these farms. Something like Grant and Don here reclaiming their right to grow, their right to transform, not just their crops and their soil, but themselves into independent, strong-minded, free people. There's a lot more people out there like us. And in our travels, we've gotten to meet a lot of them. And they're some of the most compassionate, giving, faithful, strong people I've ever met. <clears throat> we all have soft hearts, but it just, it just makes you keep going. Nobody knows better than a good farmer that we are simply the tip of the iceberg of biology when it comes to life on planet Earth. A farmer knows that their cattle, their livestock, their plants have an interdependence deep into the soil. 
just seemed like we were fighting and fighting more and more often with Mother Nature. Mother Nature always wins. I don't care if it's in her livestock side of the operation or the green side of it. And when we decided to finally start trying to work with Mother Nature is when things started working so much better out here. I cannot turn the tide in my clinics. I can't shift the momentum by working with one cancer patient at a time. It's far too slow and it's not at the root of the cause. And so I look to these farmers to realize the salvation of human health. For Zach to reveal to us what he has seen and noticed in the medical profession, and for us to be able to reveal to Zach what we have seen on the actual food production side, and then when, you, when those two things meet in the middle, it begins to paint a picture that is pretty clear but also very concerning. And it tells us that if we're going to turn around our own health and the health of our children and our grandchildren, we've got to start now. Hi, my name is Del Orleski. What I'm going to do is review and discuss a topic that I personally find so fascinating. Having studied ecology and nutrition, the microbiome really brings together all the things that I have enjoyed learning about and sharing with other people, both young and old. The microbiome connects us to the rest of the living world in ways we are just beginning to understand. In the last 20 years, and especially in the last five years, we have learned so much in this area and how important it is to our health and the health of the planet. I'm going to speak about the soil microbiome and how it relates directly to our own gut microbiome. I think of the microbiome or microbiota as the center of life. It exists on us and in us not just in our gut, but throughout our entire body. We grow our food in soil, but we also grow a garden in our own GI tract as well. So I'm going to make the connection of the health of the soil and our own health. I will review and elaborate some of the topics that were discussed in the film. I found this quote by Leonardo da Vinci that was as true 500 years ago as it is today. We know more about the movement of celestial bodies than we do about the soil underfoot. I work with young children and sometimes I'll scoop up soil from, from a forest floor or soil from the garden and ask, how many organisms are there in a handful of soil? And the response ranges from no idea to some who are brave enough to venture a guess. Then I'll say, let me ask you this. How many people are there on planet Earth? As of 2021, it is estimated that there are 7.9 billion people. And then I would explain that there are more microbes in a handful of healthy soil than there are people on the Earth. Eo Wilson, a well-known biologist and naturalist, he wrote a little article back in 1987 for conservation biology 
about the importance of invertebrates. But he also mentions about the microorganisms, the microbiome. And similar to Leonardo da Vinci, he says, we have little concept of how important any of them are to our existence. However, Dr. Zach Bush reminds us that we have wiped out 40% of the biology on Earth in just 50 years. We see this in our invertebrates like insects, bees, and butterflies, as well as the microorganisms, the microbiome. I love what he says afterwards. And yet Mother Earth keeps reaching out and saying, are you sure you don't want to keep playing? Because we have, we, we, we could have some fun together. It reminds me of the children's book, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Chief Seattle, his quote is amazing. Uh, Humankind has not woven the web of life, but we, we are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things are connected. This is a photo I took uh, at the Ashokan Center one morning. It's extraordinary how intricate the web is built. When I was in school studying biology, we often talked about the food chain, but it is much more intricate and complex. It's more like a, a food web. It is an entire complex ecosystem that is working in symphony. It is a dynamic and ever-changing harmony. But when we disrupt the harmony with herbicides, pesticides, and toxins, the web is weakened. So let's review this map of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, the most widely used herbicide today. This map is from the film you just saw. It estimates the use of glyphosate, in this case, back in 2012. So right now, it is logical to assume that it would be much higher in use today. Then we overlay a map of the highest rates of diseases. In this case, let's look at cancer. We see some correlation, but not quite enough. But remember, glyphosate is water soluble. So when we add the tributaries, rivers, streams, we see the connection. The glyphosate travels in these waterways. The Mississippi River, which, which extends from the Minnesota to the, down to the Louisiana and out into the Gulf of Mexico. And, and the, I think of this, this whole area as the elementary canal of our country. The last 90 miles, by the way, is referred to as Cancer Alley, where the highest concentration of this disease is located. It is interesting uh, that our colon cancer in our population is also so high. But keep in mind that it's not just the glyphosate, it's also the neonicotinoids, the synthetic fertilizers like, fertili like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and plastics that all empty out into the Gulf of Mexico. We are the proud makers of the second largest dead zone in the world at the base of the Mississippi. It is about the size of Rhode Island. Nitrogen creates algae blooms that die and create low oxygen levels called hypoxia. Fish can't breathe in these environments. It's like a toxic toilet of industrial waste. So what, are, what do we know about glyphosate? the active ingredient in Roundup. This is a quick history of it. First, the company Monsanto didn't create glyphosate. It was Stoffer Chemicals. It was used as a chelator of minerals to clean out industrial pipes. Monsanto bought the patent and used it initially for the same thing. Then John Franz, a, a, chem a chemist, he went down to the end of the pipe and noticed that all the plant life was dead. He thought, well, maybe we could use this as an herbicide. And so they, the pat, they patent it as an herbicide in 1974 and sold it to homeowners and landscapers. I cringe when I see this photo of dandelions because dandelions happen to be a great prebiotic food that helps grow the, the microbiome in our gut. 
we are killing the medicine that grows in our backyard. We should be eating dandelion greens rather than killing it. So when Monsanto uh, then started thinking, wow, we could use this for farmers. Farmers will find this, uh, this herbicide useful, but they couldn't because it would kill the crops that were growing nearby. But what if they protected the plants by making them more uh, resistant to the herbicide, which is how GMO or genetically modified crops started. So now they can spray as much herbicide as they want. Another term not many people are aware of is called desiccation. In some ways, it's even more dangerous because it is used close to the time of harvesting. In the northern part of our country, uh, we harvest the wheat. Uh, the, the wheat has to be harvested early before the winter sets in. And they use this technique to defoliate the wheat by spraying it with herbicide and harvesting the wheat earlier than, norm than it normally would. The glyphosate is absorbed into the wheat itself. Southern states saw this and they said, wow, we could do this uh, early and have two harvests in one season, which is exactly what they do now. Then Monsanto found that the soil microbes were dying and they saw this as a useful medicine. So they patent glyphosate in 2010 as a, an antibiotic. The word antibiotic literally means against life. It literally is killing the life in our soil. So why is this important? Let's look at the digestive system. The, micro, the microbiome is throughout the entire body, but, but in the digestive system, it starts at the mouth and also includes the nasal passages as well, which is not illustrated here. But it goes uh, from the mouth over the, the tonsils, down the esophagus, into the stomach, uh, past the pancreas, which secretes insulin, and the gallbladder, which uh, secretes bile, and emulsifies the fats and travels down into the the small intestines to absorb and, and then uh, large intestines. The surface layer of the entire GI tract is one cell thick. If you were to lay it out, it would cover the surface area of two tennis courts. So let's take a section of this one cell thick layer within the alimentary canal. In between the cells, is what they call the tight junctions, these Velcro-like connections. And, and uh, what happens if we uh, put a, a, a drop of, of glyphosate into this Petri dish, or if we eat uh, foods that have glyphosate in them, what happens is that the tight junctions are compromised. This, by the way, is uh, sometimes uh, they refer to as leaky gut. These tight junctions are, are, are compromised by, by the, uh, the, uh, these openings. And uh, so um, it's uh, small uh, particles and bacteria can enter into the bloodstream and cause inflammation. Once it's in the bloodstream, the same thing can occur in our blood brain barrier and, and also in our kidneys as well. So what does the uh, microbiome do? This is a depiction of a uh, artistic rendering of the digestive system. We have the heart and the lungs and, and the liver, but it goes to the esophagus, goes down into the stomach and then to the lower intestines and then the large intestines where it finishes digestion. This lower area is what we're gonna be concentrating on. So what does the microbiome do? First, it influences mental health. 90% of their serotonin which is called the happy hormone, a, the neurotransmitter that improves our well-being, helps us to sleep, and, and then also uh, has an effect on our immune system. It is produced in the gut, 90% of the serotonin. 50% of the dopamine, another critical neurotransmitter, comes from our gut as well. Without these it, we are more prone to uh, depression and anxiety, which is what is happening in the last 20 years as the disease has grown in our society. 
It also helps to promote a healthy skin, which is really important because it is an important part of the innate immune system, our first line of defense, the keeping toxins from entering our body. It also helps in the digestion of food. Vitamin B and vitamin K are produced here. It also breaks down protein, fats, and carbohydrates, protein into amino acids, fats into fatty acids, carbohydrates into simple sugars. Fiber, which is a, a type of carbohydrate, uh, is digested by the microbiome as well, these microorganisms. In, in our Western society, we are sadly deficient in fiber-like foods. But it is here that our digestion uh, in our digestive area where the fibers are broken down by the microorganisms. Human cells can't digest this kind of carbohydrate. We need specialized bacteria to help us digest them. It helps us protect against toxins. The microbiome is a, a gatekeeper in a way to keep the toxins from entering our bloodstream. It's also a boosts our immune system. 70% of our immune system is said to be located in our gut. 70%, that's extraordinary. So you can see why the most of our health starts in our gut. I'd like to conclude with a few quotes, one by Gabe Brownie, a regenerative farmer who says, we can improve our soil health much faster and use, uh, than we used to think. It's just a matter of following the principles of nature. What he is saying is that we have to put the biology back into, into the soil. I think of regenerative farming as a form of biomimicry. The closer we can get to echoing nature systems, the better it is for all species, including us. Window Berry, says the soil is the great connect of our lives and in the source and destination for of all. In the past year, we have focused on hand sanitizers and staying away from the very things that keep us healthy. We have experienced challenging times, no doubt. And we have to do what we have to do, but we also need to reconnect to mother earth, to touch the ground, to touch each other and our animals we live with. That is where we build a relationship with the earth, which helps us stay healthy and well. I'd like to quickly review five key principles of regenerative farming as we move into our Q&A part of our presentation. Number one, minimize soil disturbance. Two, maximize crop diversity. Number three, keep the soil covered. Number four, maintain living roots year round with cover crops. Number five, integrate livestock whenever, whenever possible. Just like, they, like the magnificent bison in the Midwest used to keep the prairie flourishing, we can do this with our own animals as well. Here I'd like to uh, give some examples of an edible forest garden, which is a form of regenerative farming. You see here that we have uh, tree, shrub, ground cover layers that mimic the natural layers of a forest. Here we have a, a larger farm that uses a similar technique. The patterns that are formed are incredibly beautiful. We can even do this in our own home with raised beds as well. So let's keep growing the microbiome. It may very well be the threads that hold the fabric of life together. I love this photo of the mycorrhizae fungi that runs under our feet uh, here. And we have a, a sometimes called the, the, the wood wide web, the communication network that is underground. Thank you for listening. I'm excited to pass on to our two guest farmers now and uh, so they can share about their uh, their experience of regenerative farming. So thank you again.
Good evening. Deep Roots Farm is a certified organic, real organic project certified and regenerative international farm in Copaic, New York, on the other side of the Hudson. Some farms that practice organic methods choose not to pay for organic certification, but the other two certifications are at no additional cost to farmers. We're part of Copaic Agricultural Center, which is part of an LLC, Northeast Farm Access, a multi-farm agricultural project. Our center is 192 acres and three farmhouses. 180 acres were moved into conservation easement and 122 acres are organically farmed. The model keeps working farms in sustainable production and supports next generation farms. It creates resilient ecological communities offering long-term leases at low cost and is built a collaboration of farmers. We share equipment, we help each other with things like putting up greenhouses or dealing with emergencies. The other farms on our, in our center are Tiny Hearts Flower Farm, Burrow Mushrooms, Camp Hill Copig, and Afro Futurist Ecology. This is the third year Deep Roots is on the property. So regeneration has become a popular and overused term now and is applied widely as is the term organic. Ultimately, a regenerative farm would be one that includes cover cropping, which we do, crop rotation, which we do, not growing a monocrop in the same place year after year, like you'll see in many of the cornfields up here, composting and application, which we do, no-till, we low-till, in the cover crops and compost due to our very dry clay rocky soil. Organic practices, which we do, and building soil and sequestering carbon, which we are doing. A pure regenerative system would include animals, which we don't. It's a challenge to do it all on one farm. We grow vegetables, fruit, flowers, herbs, and garlic. We bring in chicken manure from a local farm. We also use fish emulsion and surround, a clay-based product for our curcubits, and worm casting solution fertilizer. Adding animals to a farm makes it a 365 day a year job. Farming the way we do requires a lot more employees than industrial farming and many hours, seven days a week during the season. I have to say the farmers in the Hudson Valley are by far some of the smartest hardworking people I've ever met or worked with. We sell our products at farmers markets in Westchester and Putnam counties, CSAs, we have about a hundred members and wholesale. We do send out emails on nutritional benefits of what members are receiving in the CSA and how to prepare what they get in their weekly um, bag. And we donate to Long Table Harvest who supply much of the local farm surplus to people in need. Over the past years, it's encouraging to see that more and more people care about how their food is grown. It just takes a lot of education to change the system and getting people to taste the difference made available equally. Since agriculture and land use are responsible for 25% of human caused greenhouse gas emissions, the most impactful thing we can do in a hurry is to change the way we eat. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Aaliyah from Clove Valley Community Farm. Okay, hi. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. 
Um, yeah, and thanks for having me on this. I, um, my big draw for joining this panel is that I've been um, selling veggies at the Woodstock Farmers Market for the last 12 years. And I know that this community um, of, through the transition movement was um, started in Woodstock. And so hopefully some of my beloved market customers are in the, um, I don't know, in the audience right now. So this will be my 12th year farming at Clove Valley Community Farm. And the first year was actually, we were actually called Regeneration CSA. And it wasn't until I was invited on this panel that I even realized that regenerate, regenerative agriculture is actually a certification that you can get. So that's interesting. Um, we are too small to certify. We sell directly to our customers and a lot of them rightly assume that we're organic based on the obviously like small hand scale painted signs and whatever, but we, um, we call ourselves beyond organic, which I don't believe is an official term, but it refers to that we, we're absolutely no spray, no till. We have a, a whole series of permanent raised beds that we've been developing over many years. And um, I did, did you get any photos? Anyway, um, I sent some photos, but that's okay. Um, the photos I sent were of how we re regenerate the soil is mainly through spreading compost. We spread compost every year by hand. And um, I call, we also, I also we call, um, I'll say community powered farm sort of versus a tractor powered farm. A lot of our work is done by volunteers and CSA members. And every year I have a garlic planting party that fifth, like 50 plus people come and it, um, I'm considering it calling it a mulching party because we spend a lot of our time carrying organic matter to the back garden, which you can't drive to. So having tons and tons of people moving bags of leaves and straw and um, all that kind of stuff is really um, necessary in this model. And in 12 years, I went from having soil that I had to have a hand, like a pickaxe to hack into um, in order to plant to like, kind of like you can reach your whole arm in there and it's really luscious and everyone who comes and plants in there is like, oh my gosh, these beds are so nice. So it's been amazing to watch 12 years of soil be built by many, many hands. And we do have a plant sale ongoing. One of our main goals, aside from feeding people, is being a community education center. And we invite everyone to come on Thursdays mostly. So all of you are welcome to come on a Thursday. And you can volunteer, you can visit. Right now, um, from four to seven, we're selling um, organic vegetable plants. And Memorial Day weekend will be open. And um, I lost track of the time, but I think it's probably five minutes and time for question and answer. So I hope that anything you want to know more about the farm, you will come and see for yourself. That would be number one, but um, bring on the questions. And thanks, everyone. Um. Hi, thank you very much. This is Joan, uh, Joan after I'm going to be moderating the Q&A. If you have questions, can you put them in the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat box, so that um, we can get all your questions. And I'd like to thank Nancy Custer of Deep Roots Farm for that great presentation and Ilea Kavache from Clove Valley Farm. Thank you very much. And of course, Del Orlowski um, for his uh, microbiome presentation. Wonderful. So far, our questions. 
George asks, what can we ask Biden to do to move us from industrial glycophosphate or glyphos glyphosate? Oh, Glyph glyphosate. Glyphosate. Uh, from industrial glyphosate farming to regenerative farming nationwide. Anybody want to take that on? It's not my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a political question. We should add a politician here. Um, Meg wants to know where Clow Valley Farm is. Clow Valley Farm is in High Falls, which is close to Rosendale, right across the gunks from New Paltz. It's 40 minutes from Woodstock and an hour and a half north of the city. <laughs> and is there a website that she can look up? Sure, it's um, clovalleycommunityfarm.com. Uh, Rosalind wants to know, do you have any problem with invasive jumping worms? Anyone wants to take that one? I, I don't have any problem with that. I actually don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't either. Well, I do a little bit. Uh, um, we, uh, we had that with the pollinator pathway program. Uh, we were actually concerned last fall uh, when we did a, uh, we were gonna do a plant exchange and uh, that topic came up uh, that we might exchange these um, jumping worms. They're not really, they don't jump, uh, they actually wiggle so much uh, on the surface and they, they regenerate the, uh, the surface layer uh, so quickly uh, that it's um, the carbon actually doesn't get into the soil. So, uh, so that's a, a real problem, but I don't know the farmers, I, that's, that's interesting. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen uh, those uh, jumping worms in the Catskill area yet, but I heard that they are uh, entering and it's a major invasive uh, worm. Yeah, the main the main bugs that bother me are the flea beetle, <laughs> and the new on the scene allium leaf miner, <laughs> which I for many years I didn't get, have to worry about the garlic and onions, and they were a pretty low maintenance crop. But the last couple of years, we've had to cover them, which takes a lot of work because there's swarms of these bugs that are flying overhead and laying their eggs on them and ruining the crops. <laughs> so. That's like the new one that is my little bugaboo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tom asks, what's wrong with tilling? It releases carbon into the atmosphere. And we want to keep it in the ground. Right, but it's, it's also not, I mean, I think about this all the time because I'm a no-till farm. But I think there's, I have no problem with tilling as long as it's done in a really conscious way. It's sometimes you can see these tall stands of beautiful, beautiful cover crops that are, you know, bringing carbon down. And how else are you supposed to get it into the ground aside from mow it and till it in? And if you are able to till it in and then recapture it again in the crop, versus have it all wash away, then you can convert that cover crop into another form of carbon without having too much of it. You can have a net gain if you're careful. Um, Margaret asks very similarly, uh, Nancy, can you describe low till? basically similar to what Aaliyah was talking about. We don't have a big giant tiller that goes deep into the soil. We just have a, a, a light tiller that gets those cover crops into the soil. Um, so we're not like churning up all of the ground. Uh, we're trying to do as little as that, of that as we can. Right, and there's um, there's a distinction between the rototiller implement and the disc. Mm -hmm. A lot of farmers use a disc, which is more just like vertical spinning wheels that chop up everything, which is a little less destructive than the 
tiller with all like all the rotating times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Meg asks, how do permaculture and sustainable farming relate to regenerative farming? Uh, well, permaculture is regenerative. Um, it, it, it includes trees and perennials and using what's indigenous to the area and um, you're not necessarily, uh, um, you're, you're building crops that are perennial that keep growing every year. You're not planting annuals all the time. So that's. And sustainable farming, would that be pretty much in the same ballpark as uh, regenerative? It's like Half well, a dozen sustainable is, is that's been a word that's also been difficult because we don't want to sustain what we're doing right now. We want to regenerate. So, I mean, sustainability was used before, but I think a lot of people just realize that that's not a good term um, in that we don't want to sustain what we're doing. Right. Thank you. Uh, any comments, Dell? Yeah, I think uh, sustainability is like um, is is an old term uh, now. Um, we're we're in a uh, we're in an unhealthy situation, uh, and and if we continue uh, maintaining uh, the the situation as it is, uh, uh, we're not going to get better. It's it's going to get worse. Uh, uh, so we have to actually. And, and increase and, and, and put the biology back into the soil. Uh, and uh, by keeping, you know, those five principles uh, uh, that I had mentioned, you know, are, are really helpful. And all those things, carbon farming, um, you know, the permaculture, uh, for, uh, food forest uh, gardening, all those uh, are terms. There's many, many different term, uh, terminologies that, that use uh, and try to mimic uh, uh, the biology of nature they, they're mimicking nature's systems and uh, they do it really, really well. And there's, uh, and there's, you know, so that's how I would uh, discuss uh, sustainability. Great, thank you. Uh, Carol asks, what cover crop do you recommend for a home vegetable garden and what do you do with it in the spring? Hmm. Yeah, I, um. I don't know if I recommend cover crops for a home vegetable garden. At, at that scale, you can really bring in a lot of compost and mulch. Yeah. That's what I would do. I agree. Build up your soil with compost. Yeah, and put- we winter rye, our farm, but we have 35 acres. So we do winter rye and peas and oats, but um, you know, it's a lot of acreage. A home garden, I would, I would agree with Aaliyah that building up your compost with your food scraps and your yard waste and yeah and you can find a lot of free um leaves on the side of the in the fall a lot of people rake up their leaves and put them in bags on the side of the road and you can fill up um the back of your truck or car or whatever and use that to actually bring in mulch and organic material yeah, and that's what we do like cover cropping is more like producing the um the carbon that you're adding into the soil whereas i often collect it <laughs> so it's still like it's still moving it in the general direction of growing and building soil but um i'm often bringing it in because i don't have enough a big enough farm to cover crop large parts of it i need to um think of the general region as the farm like the whole system and i'm bringing in carbon from out of the farm and putting it onto the farm and using it to grow things that uh, you know grow soil basically thank you 
We've just had, uh, I, I have to use uh, um, uh, a green, um, what they call green manure sometimes, the uh, winter rye. And when the temperatures are above uh, 40 degrees uh, in winter, which you get often, uh, it does grow. And then in the spring, it, it grows quite high. And then you have to till it into the ground. So they call it green manure because it has a lot of nitrogen in, in the, uh, the green uh, living matter. But uh, um, uh, on small scales, uh, just covering, making sure that the, the ground is covered, uh, whether any kind of carbon, whether it be a hay or, or leaves or anything, uh, um, is, is going to make a, a, a big difference in terms of uh, keeping the carbon into the soil rather than releasing it back into the, uh, the earth, you know, the sky. Yeah, and one, one thing I do a lot is um, rather than rip out my crops, I let them, I, I know a lot of, there's this aesthetic that some people look for of a clean bed where you rip everything out and the soil is just bare and that looks like it's right or good. But in reality, it's better if, like in my opinion, it's better if you, if you let the crops rot in there, those roots in there are gold for the soil. So ripping it out, something that's gonna die over the winter anyway, is not necessarily as good as you think. I, I leave as many of my crops in as possible to rot and die <laughs> in the soil. And if it's, if it's not in the way, I'll, I'll just cut the top off and plant next to the dead crop. So I'd like to leave, leave those roots in there. Yeah, and you can think of your crops as cover crops too. They act sort of the same way in a way. If you have a broccoli plant and you take the head of the broccoli, the rest of it, you can chop it up and spread it on the top of the top. Or you, you know, or if you prefer, put it in your compost pile and then bring it back later. But in, on, at my scale, it's a lot less work to chop and drop. <laughs> like bring job. it all out, turn it a bunch of times, and then bring it back. Yeah. Ooh, remember that. <laughs> That's a new bumper sticker. Chop and drop. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make it up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rosalind says, uh, the invasive worms are causing a lot of problems in the Midwest. They have been in our area for many years. They eat organic matter and rootlets. You can get info from master gardeners. Dell, come to my house in August and I'll show you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you bet. Thank you. Debbie says, do you recommend cover crop? Oh, this already got covered. Do you recommend cover crops for a home raised bed garden? If so, what types? I think we already covered that. Anybody have anything else to say about that? No. You can, yeah, you, but do you want to keep your soil covered like what Aaliyah said? So you can also put straw on top of your beds. That's another option. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mary Jo says, uh, regarding minimal tilling, what if the soil is very compacted a few inches down? Yeah, so ours was, and um, it's been farmed, um, well, I mean, it took a while to get it into the organic, building up organic matter. So it, it was basically keeping adding compost and um, organic matter in order to build up what you have instead of trying to dig down and churn it all up. So that's what our farm has done. Right, and we, we, use, we do a lot of forking. The broad fork is a really classic tool for a small, for a small market garden or gar garden um, where it has these long tines that go in and you're not, till, you're not tilling, you're not stirring everything up, but you're, lo you're loosening it and aerating it so that um, you know, roots and soil and air and water, the soil deepens by forking. So you can use a broad fork or just a digging fork which is different from a pitchfork in that it's strong, it has like straight, really strong tines and not these long curved ones that would break under pressure. 
So I like forking a lot. So when you fork, you just put it in the ground and move back and forth kind of thing? Yeah. Like sort of like put it in all the way and then lift. Like just move, shift it back. So it kind of like, it doesn't, like I'll tell people like, you know, the volunteers and whatnot, not don't stir up the soil, um, but just lift, you know. Aerate, that's a good word. Yeah. Anybody have anything to add with that? Okay. Anonymous says, from a business point of view, what are the most difficult aspects of running a regenerative farm? <laughs> well, one of them is, is people. And a lot of farms around here are having trouble hiring people. Uh, that, um, but yeah, you need a lot of people. You, lot, you need a lot more people than an industrial farm where you're using all machines. Yep. I agree that that's number one. <laughs> and yeah, if you're not, yeah, and likewise, if you're, you know, you're not, you're not spraying chemical pesticides to take care of the weeds, then you have to actually weed the weed, take the weeds out often by hand or with a hoe. Even if you have a tractor that can help out, there's still, I mean, that's part of where the labor comes in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Beverly asks, if you mulch with leaves, do you work the leaves into the soil in the spring? I, I do not. But it if I if I'm it depends on the crop if I'm able to leave them on the surface and spread you know if I were just planting a crop that is widely spaced and you're able to just make a little pocket in the leaves and maybe add some compost into that pocket and plant into it um, then great but if you're gonna if you're gonna seed carrots or something like that then I would rake the leaves off into another place that they'll be useful. Move them somewhere else. I would, I would add, uh, it also it depends on the type of, uh, of um, uh, leaves that there are. If you have a lot of oak leaves, it's going to have a lot of tannins in it and they're going to break down very hard. Uh, they're good for the surface in, uh, of uh, forests and things like that, and even in the garden. But uh, maple leaves are, are going to break down a lot quicker. Uh, and that's true of other trees. Uh, some will grow, um, break down very, very quickly and others will um, stay um, for longer periods. So they have to, you have to get a, a lot of surface area on the break by uh, crushing the, uh, like even oak leaves, by crushing it, uh, the bacteria and fungi can break it down a lot quicker. Um, you know, it's just like uh, digestion, you, you know, it's like uh, all these bacteria and, and fungi, the microbiome is actually uh, digestion uh, of the, uh, the carbon. So, and that's, that's part of the, uh, the idea of getting the biology back into the soil. And one thing I do a lot when I need the, when I need the bed for seeding something or when the leaves are in the way is if you move them, I know at a very small scale, often wood chips, you can, if you're, if you have a small enough garden, you can have wood chip pathways, but I do not, I'm not able to do that. And I often use the cover that has been on the bed to mulch the pathway. And then throughout the season, the we, the pathways don't get very weedy. So over the, it's a, it seems like a good system over the winter, I'll cover almost all the beds and then in the spring, a lot of those, the cover ends up in the pathway, which will eventually end up back on the bed someday, when, once it breaks down. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, but it becomes a weed, a weed um, suppressant. Thank you. Um, Meg asks, are there cooperative efforts amongst any farms in Woodstock area? What was it? Are there any cooperative efforts amongst any farms in the Woodstock area? Farms working together, I would imagine. Do, do I count as the Woodstock, like the Woodstock area, like within 45 minutes of Woodstock or? <laughs> We're gonna say yes, you count. 
because I um that's something I actually wrote down that I wanted to note about my farm is that we really do work with a lot of other farms. I mean, for one thing, there's a listserv of farmers and there's con like I don't think that f many farmers think of each other as competition. We're all in on the same team and want to help each other out and one person's surplus of knowledge or equipment or this or that can be another person's like something that they need and um so in general there's a spirit of comp of, con of um cooperation among all the local farms around here i would say and i specifically partner with some farms more intensely i i right now i'm sharing a greenhouse with one of my neighboring farms and we split the cost of the propane and take turns watering and just i'm you know like i'll see that he's doing something i'm like oh that's interesting i haven't thought to do it that way before i'll try that or you know just a knowledge sharing thing and then um i have a couple other people that i share crops with or do work like we'll do i'll bring my crew over there and they bring their crew over my place or um i have a, personally a lot of that going on it's really important to me yeah and Aaliyah, were you talking about the, the Hudson Valley Young Farmers Coalition listserv? Right. The listserv yeah. yeah, so that's a really good resource for farmers to, to, you know, every day we get, does anyone have this or can anyone do this? Or I have a lot of mushroom spores left over. Does anybody want them? You know, there's a lot of that going on. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Georgia says, a bill currently before the New York State Legislature bans the use of corn, soy, and wheat seeds treated with neonicotinoid pesti pesticides in New York State. Neonics kill birds and bees and contaminate the soil and water. Call your state senator to support S699-2021, an assembly person, to support A4082 dash 2021. Everybody got that? That's a, okay. Margaret says, Dell, could you say more about the gluten sensitivity not being the problem, but the toxins from the wheat? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, a thought on um, the uh, because of the uh, glyphosate it affects the tight junctions in the uh, the alimentary canal. Um, it uh, it weakens it, um, and uh, and it has the same similar um, uh, symptoms uh, of gluten intolerance. So a lot of people that are are actually uh, not really gluten intolerant. They're they're glyphosate uh, overdosed, um, and they're and inspecting their uh, the um, the absorption you know, of their their uh, their gut, and uh, so that's a real problem. And uh, and it's um, uh, and the, the fact that we're killing the uh, the microbiome in the soil so much with the antibiotics. You know, I, that's one of the things that I didn't even realize. Uh, but in studying uh, glyphosate, um, it's you know it's actually an antibiotic, um, and uh, it's killing the soil. So. It's in, in, in the same way, we're, we're, uh, we're doing that with uh, our medication, uh, overuse of, uh, of antibiotics in our medication. I just uh, went, uh, I saw a, a wonderful a webinar by the Cary Institute uh, did a, a, a topic on, on streams and rivers and the effects of uh, medication uh, that uh, end up getting into those streams and uh, how they affect the wildlife and, and, the, and the microorganisms in, in the river. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's the uh, gluten uh, intolerance is, is that's something that you should uh, really look into uh, in terms of um, you know looking at it. But if you if you uh, um, because the glyphosate is sprayed as a desiccant, it's right at the time it's absorbed into the wheat, and a lot of people don't realize that that the uh, whole wheat. Uh, grown in conventional farms are probably more dangerous than the processed uh, wheat, the white wheat uh, that you would normally think that uh, normally you would think the whole wheat would be better. 
but it's uh, it's actually not because there's more glyphosate on the surface of the of the wheat. So um, uh, sprouting is a really an important thing. Getting making sure that it's organic, um, uh, and uh, you know that's uh, all those things are really um, effective in keeping the um, you know the the effect of uh, um, gluten intolerance or um, so, but. I, I, I hope that answers the question uh, a little bit further. Thank you. Margaret says, I thought the problem with tilling and digging was that you were breaking up the soil structure. Well, um, the pro I mean, digging, and tilling, breaking up the soil structure. That's what Nancy said about how when, you know, you chop everything up tilling, a lot of it does end up getting released into the atmosphere and is broken up. Um, and that's true. That is the problem with it. And if there can be more benefits than problems, like if you're integrating a lot of cover crops that you're gonna use right away and cover with, and hold on to the nutrients, then maybe it um, can be worth it if you're able to grow more food that way. And I, I think of it as, a, um, you know, I, I am picturing uh, the mycorrhizae fungi that, that goes underneath the root system. I think of it as a, uh, as a communication network uh, of, of plants. And I, you know, I often talk about this with the young people and adults um, about this this uh, network. Now, if you, you you cut these, it's almost like cutting the lines of communication. You know, you build a road and you're cutting it. You know, you're building, uh, and and these plants have to find new ways of connecting again, uh, building you know any kind of um, uh, this destruction of the the um, the surface layer. Uh, the more you do it, the more of the communication, the plants can't communicate uh, uh, back and forth to each other. And uh, so that's how I, I look at uh, the whole uh, network and why the structure. Also moving the, the particles, uh, clay soils, um, um, silt soils, and sand soils in an organic manner, it, they're all interacting into with, with each other. So the more you, you work the soil uh, without adding more organic matter, I mean, almost all the problems, like if you have clay soil, what's the answer? More organic. If you have uh, a, a, a sandy soil, what is it, the answer? You put more organic <laughs> into it. Both of them are, are going to hold the moisture. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's true that, you know, when you till, it seems in the beginning very fluffy, but you do end up compacting the soil ultimately pretty quickly. So the fluffiness is just a, um, I don't know, a very brief thing. <laughs> Great, thank you. Our time is, is running very short, but uh, Larry wants us to know about www.longspooncollective.org, which is an important local um, collective. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, we long spooners cooperate between three to four different farms in biking distance to Woodstock. So that's a good one for everyone to know, www.longspooncollective.org. And we have one more minute. Um, Max Ann, this is a good question. How do you how did both, how did you both get into farming and learn? And you've got one minute, no. <laughs> you first, Nancy. Um, <laughs> well, I grew up working in gardens and um, then volunteering in gardens. And even, I was always in education, but um, in the last few years, what I did was I volunteered at a whole bunch of farms around here and worked on farms and just got to see what people were doing and what ones I thought were doing the right work. And um, yeah, so it's been years of a lot of volunteering and then having my own garden at home and then 
getting a job. Nice. Well, I, I, um, I did grow up in the country and was a big backyard and my parents were ho like homesteaders for my first couple of years, but I always, I went the conventional route of just going right to college, the pre-med. And it wasn't until after college that I traveled in Hawaii and met people who were woofing, were um, volunteering on farms. And I um, tried that out for myself and fell in love really with um, farming when I was right out of college. And I didn't, didn't know right away that I would make a career out of it because they all said it was impossible. <laughs> But um, that was a while ago, and I'm still doing it. So. And I think that, um, yeah, that that turn in the road was way back, and I'm not going back there now. I'm I'm in it. <laughs> so now you're doctoring the land. Yeah, and I mean, I have my degree is in um, chemistry and biology, and teaching, and I actually am doing all the, you know, mm -hmm. I'm conducting experiments constantly and teaching people every day. So I'm sort of using my degree. <laughs> I think you have to be very multidisciplined to be a farmer. There's so many things you have to be able to know and do, you know? Yeah, it occupies a huge amount of my brain. <laughs> constantly thinking about every aspect of the farm. Well, thank you very, very much. We have uh, had some wonderful questions and your answers have been great. I'm going to pass you back to Holly, who is going to close the um, evening tonight. Thank you again. That concludes the fourth program of our ninth annual film and discussion series. We hope you enjoyed the evening. There were great questions and really great answers. It was really enjoyable. In about two days, you will get an email directing you to the recording of the entire event on the Woodstock Land Conservancy's YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us and good night. <laughs>